Welcome in to the Ots and Audibles podcast. Matt Prem, Eric Scopel, Jared Mack on the show today. Uh, it's a Thursday, which means it's bold predictions, preview, and game picks of Oregon, number, who's number six in the country uh, in the college football playoff rankings, taking on the USC Trojans, who come into Watson Stadium for the first time since 2015 when a man named Vernon Adams was running the Oregon offense. Uh, that's how long it's been. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were supposed to be here in 2020, and then 2020 happened. Um but it's a game in which it always matters because it's Oregon versus USC. It's um, probably the most successful school in the conference for at least one more year until the conference goes away uh, in its history. And USC against kind of what <clears throat> was viewed as the new kid on the block and then is no longer the new kid on the block in Oregon. But it's lost a little bit's luster. USC has lost uh, two, three of its last four. Um, they're seven and three on the season. They're not ranked. Um, I don't, I didn't buy into USC being a national champion hype beginning of the year, like the national media presented them as, because we knew all their issues going in the lack of an offensive line, uh, defense, but to not have them ranked at all is a little bit of a surprise to me. Like I, I, I still figured they would have been a team in the college football playoff rankings, in early November, which is where they're not at. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no question. I mean, I was excited for this game to maybe be a couple of top 10 teams. I mean, I, I was, I think, maybe higher than you were, Matt, in terms of what I thought USC could be just with what they have at quarterback. Um, they have good tackles on the offensive line. Uh, they went out and acquired good defensive players in the portal. Like, there was reason to be optimistic that they were going to get better, and yet it looks very similar to the issues that, you know, cause them to lose some games last year, not win the conference a year ago. Like I just, I think if you're a USC fan, you're probably feeling like this is kind of a repeat of the issues we had in 22 in 23. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm really surprised that this is Oregon hosting an unranked USC team. I, I still think it's got a chance to be a more competitive oh, yes. game than people. Some people are making it out to be, but I mean, when we talked about this game before the season, I think this was for, for some of us, the game we thought was that Morgan was the most acceptable to lose. And that, that, don't, that certainly no longer feels the case. Definitely not. Uh, I was very high on USC at the start of the year. I thought what they did in the offseason, bringing in the transportal additions like Bear Alexander, Bear Alexander, Mason Cobb, and some of their offensive linemen um, was exactly what the, the Trojans needed to get over that hump. Because last year, uh, you know, you, you saw it, it epitomized in the Alamo Bowl, or not the Alamo Bowl, the Cotton Bowl against Tulane, where, you know, they had this big lead and then they gave it up because their defense just could not. Uh, bring anything to the table for their offense. Uh, and when you have Caleb Williams, who's probably the best quarterback in the country, if not the second best, depending on how you feel about Drake May or Michael Penix, um, that's usually a good recipe for success, at least to start. But uh, yeah, their defense hasn't been anything different than it was last season. I talked about this on Tuesday. Um, the, the the reason that their last year's defense was better than this year was because of the turnover margin. They were plus 23 or plus 21 last year, and now they're like plus two or plus three. So that's a huge difference um, in terms of their defensive ability this year. They just haven't been creating turnovers. Um, they've been giving up the ball a little bit more and they can't stop anybody on the ground. and can't stop anybody through the air. So yeah. those are not recipes for success. Um, I originally had Oregon losing this game to start the season. Uh, I had no idea what Oregon's, what Oregon's defense is going to look like their past defense. Um, and I thought, you know, beginning of the year, uh, if it were anything like it was last season, or it really struggled against good quarterbacks and good wide receivers. Uh, this would probably be the worst matchup for them possibly on the schedule other than Washington. Um, but I do not believe that will be the case. Um, I'm kind of disappointed that this isn't like a top 15, top 10 shoot, even a top 25 matchup between these two programs. Um, I think USC has the talent to be a top 25 or even like a top 15 team for sure. But uh, their execution and, and play style is just – just hasn't been good, but maybe no more Alex Grinch could be uh, something that turns the page for them defensively, but I doubt it. This will be USC's seventh straight game since a bye week. Um, Mm -hmm. They did something kind of unique where they got two byes this year. Um, They played three games, including a week zero game. And then as, or six straight game, excuse me, this is their sixth straight game going in. And, um, 
UCLA is next week at home, and then they have a bye week. They were banking on Pac-12 championship, maybe sneaking in a bye right before then, and which would have been a very savvy move. I mean, I think um, Josh Pate was the one that tipped us off to that. Like none of us really realized that at the Washington game. Um, that was a sneaky move by them. And I'm curious just to see kind of like how has that impacted this team? Like, are they, in, you know, sounds like they're healthy. Um, they've got a couple guys coming back um, from injury, most notably Marshawn Lloyd, their running back, who leads the nation in yards per carry. He just doesn't get the ball enough times to um, get the, you know, I guess the the attention nationally that, he should be getting because he's a damn good running back and he's like a bowling ball five nine and 220 pounds um but how much does this wear and tear of so many games in a row uh impact usc will, will there be a surprise player that doesn't you know make the trip or doesn't see see the field i don't know oregon's healthy we should note that bucky irving wasn't at practice when we were there eric and jared were there on tuesday but um, Eric sounds like he was there on Wednesday, which is a good sign. And there really isn't much else from an injury standpoint. I, I don't think Bucky was ever hurt to be clear. Yeah. Um, and I want to make it, I mean, we, we've had a lot of people say we've tried to, we've blown this stuff out of proportion. We're just reporting what we saw. And I think if you listen to our podcast on Tuesday, Jared and I are very upfront about the, th- the fact that we didn't think this was anything significant. Um, I guess we've learned from what people, people may perceive as mistakes with the doorless thing, but even then I thought we were pretty cautious. So, um, but yeah, Bucky Irving, he's going to be available. I don't think there's any question. And um, the Ducks are really at full strength. There's not a whole lot else to add in terms of the injury report. There are several guys who are kind of been known to be out for a while, with you no know, Whittington being the most prominent. Other than that, it's like Justice Lowe, a reserve receiver, Andrew Boyle, the kickoff specialist. Like Those are the guys who are out right now. It, it's a like it's pretty impressive what Oregon has been able to do in terms of staying healthy. I'm going to knock on wood here because by saying that, of course, I'm setting the jinx up for Saturday. Right. But mm-hmm. it weathered the storm. I mean, you're this far in the season, and there's one significant injury. Like not, that, not a, that's not very commonplace. So um, yeah, Oregon's coming into this one basically full strength from a health perspective. The only other name that I would note was uh, Devin Jackson, who hasn't seen the field. I think maybe since. Uh, since Utah or maybe even Washington State, um, he's been. Dan said that he's been dinged up, and they've been precautious with him, to, kept him out of practice. Um, but he was he was out there on the he's been out there on the field. He just we haven't seen him go full blow yet, but he did this past practice, so that's a good sign uh, just for linebacking depth for Oregon. Uh, Devin Jackson's probably the fastest linebacker in the room, so that might help in some some type of pass coverage situation. Uh, and then Kamari Terrell is another guy who was just a full participant this past week at practice on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, we haven't seen him go full participant in a minute. Um, he's been in trainers and practice for the last week or two, I think. Um, so just uh, more depth, um, no, no big injuries. And like Eric said, um, nothing really to be concerned about with Bucky Irving. We saw him on Wednesday, looked good, full participant. Uh, I just think it's more of a give this guy a breather type of deal. Um, like I said, on Tuesday, if you can give these guys a breather and it not affect you, I think that's the right idea. Rest days are good. Um, here. Mm-hmm. Your your answer to Devin Jackson, Jared, is Washington State checking the game log of his profile is the last time he saw the field. He did not play yeah. uh, yep, Utah true. or um, California this past weekend. So two weeks. Um, what USC looks like? On the field, I mean, we know they're not good, but what's kind of the mood of this team? Alex Grinch has been <laughs> removed. You just yeah. suddenly said, we know they're not good. They're not good. <laughs> they're not good. <laughs> like, USC or I, like their defense? Both. Okay. Like, I mean, their offense is good. Caleb Williams is good. But you guys both said, like, you thought they were going to be a lot better than what they are. They're not good. They're not They're not as good as their expectations. They have three losses. They were a top five team, I think, to start the season. And they're not ranked in November. Um, they have to make – they had to make a coaching change. Uh, that's – those are signs of you're not good. Like, could they – do they have talent? Yes, absolutely. But I don't think that they're good. They can't stop anybody. They can't stop a sneeze on defense. I mean, Dylan Johnson rushed for like 250 on a passing offense. I, I think he's a good running back, but two, like 
240 yards or whatever it was last week. Like that's embarrassingly bad. And what does this team look like when they show up? I mean, I, I, I asked that question to Shotgun Spratling and Ryan Abraham. Abraham's the publisher of uscfootball.com and Shotgun's one of his um, beat reporters for the team for USC football. And you know, they both said like they're going to, they try, they care, but they were very adamant. Like this team isn't good defensively. And, you know, don't, don't think this team's just going to fold because the season's over. They're not going to make the playoffs, but he said, they're going to try hard, but trying hard doesn't equate to making plays because they're just not good defensively. There are definitely massive deficiencies on this team. There's no question about that. I would debate that. I mean, I think they're still a pretty solid football team. I mean, obviously, they're not in the top 25. I'm not going to say they're great. And the fact that they're not ranked right now is a massive disappointment. This is, this season has undoubtedly been way below expectations of what USC was expected to be. And frankly, what USC should be year in and year out with this kind of a roster. I think they're top 10 in the country on the 24-7 sports team composite. And to not even be ranked, mm-hmm. certainly disappointing. Um But they still have talent on this team, and the offense is definitely good. This is the second scoring offense in the country behind Oregon. These are the top two scoring offenses. There's all sorts of NFL caliber players on that offense, obviously led by by Caleb Williams. I mean, this is a team that, aside from a stinker against Notre Dame, has still consistently put up 35, 40, 50 points every single week. So um, offensively, they're definitely good. They're definitely better than good. But defensively, they're very much not. Um, and that's the part we can get into without question here later on the show. But I mean, I think offensively, this is a team that puts stress everywhere. Right. Um, Lloyd's availability. No, I, I, I agree with that. They're good offensively. I'm not trying to push back on that. Yeah. No, I just think the general sentiment that they're not good as a team, I would disagree with a little bit. Not to say that we'll get to predictions at the end. I think we're all going to pick Oregon to win and probably Oregon to win fairly comfortably, I'm, I'm guessing. But um, just because of the way these two teams have been playing, like, I think Oregon is undoubtedly the better of the two teams, just to make that point clear. Like, I don't, like, I know when we were predicting the Oregon Washington game earlier this year, um, there were obviously people who were really angry about us for the way we landed there. But my point going in is I thought those teams were pretty even. I don't feel that's the case right now with Oregon and USC. I think Oregon has clearly proven to be better than USC over the course of especially the last month. Um, but you have to like at least look at USC and say offensively, like they are a really impressive operation. And Lincoln Riley is a very good offensive coach. That's never been his problem at either stop, right? Like even at Oklahoma, like they won a ton of games and it wasn't because they had good defenses. Like you can go back and look at the numbers there. Like (laughs) it wasn't pretty there either defensively, but they've always been good in offense and this year is no different. And I think um, Marshawn Lloyd part will be interesting. Um, They were able to establish a pretty good run game last week. We should note, even without him, Austin Jones filled in nicely. I think he had over hundred yards rushing, but Lloyd to me is probably the most talented running back not on Oregon's roster in this conference. I don't know if you guys want to debate that too much, but um, no, I agree. You could put Ott really in there. Good. You could put in Jaquindon Jackson in there, but I, Oregon just played Jackson a couple weeks ago. It wasn't a very impressive game. Like when you watch Lloyd and maybe part of it is because of the, the same Jersey number, like there's a little bit of Bucky in terms of the ability to avoid going down on first contact. Like he is, yeah. he's, he's an he's, NFL dude. He's an NFL guy, and he's tough to take down. So yeah. um, it's. I just wanted to bring that up because I think we focus and everybody focuses so much on the pass attack, as they should, because it's extremely dynamic and there's just so many guys. But it's not like they're just a completely one-dimensional operation on offense. They have a really talented running back. They've established the run pretty well this year. Um, like I said earlier, they're actually decent at tackle in terms of the offensive line. It's the interior mm-hmm. where they've gotten some issues this year. Um, but – We'll see. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, if, if Lloyd doesn't play, you should feel a lot more confident about where things are at. I do know he returned to practice earlier this week, at least according to Connor Morissette from uh, uscfootball.com. He said he's yeah. playing. So I think there's optimism he will play. Um, but I don't think Riley has also even commented one way or the other, but that's very – that's very uh, Dan Lanning, Pac-12 football coach. Like just college football coaches have not wanting to tip the hand, I think. It was it was weird that he didn't play last week. It was kind of like a, a game time decision that um, not a lot of people knew about, and then he just wasn't playing. So I don't expect that to happen. I would imagine he's playing uh, against Oregon because he got hurt in the Cal game. Uh, so this is two weeks removed, but uh, that's certainly an, an aspect of USC's offense that Oregon's going to want to limit and control. Um, I said on Tuesday, I think that 
USC's best offense is when they can um, establish the run, which sounds weird for a Lincoln Riley offense or led offense, but um, if they can establish the run and get some guys in the box and then, you know, release their uh, very talented wide receiving core over the middle and down the sidelines, like that makes life way easier for Caleb Williams instead of having, you know, eight guys drop back into coverage and play dime all the time. Um, and Marshawn Lloyd, I, I think is, yeah, no, I think he's right there at the top of the Pac-12 for most talented running back um, with Bucky. Um, I think they're both probably more talented than Jordan James personally, but uh, that's just more of a preference thing. I like a bigger running back to me. Um, I, I So that's a, that's a big name that could play and that could not play. Um, I'm hoping he plays. I'd like to see him um, just in person. I think that'd be a lot of fun, and I think it would be a good test against Oregon's defense. And uh, that's part of the reason why USC is – still good of a team is they can give anybody a scare just because of that offense you saw last week against washington um you know 42 points i know they lost by 10 but that's the number five team in the country um they certainly made a statement they like eric said they established the run uh caleb williams had a pretty good day um like that offense can can compete with anybody in the country and that's the reason why um they can i know that their season has been rather disappointing but that's the reason why they can still potentially beat anybody. It's just because of their offense and because of Caleb Williams and because of the play calling that Lincoln Riley has and because of the weapons. Um, and again, I'm not saying that they're going to beat Oregon. Uh, I have Oregon to win. We'll get to the predictions. But um, that's just a good overall offense. And and all the problems have remained on the defense. It's the tail oldest time for Lincoln Riley. And like Eric mentioned, you know, go back to Oklahoma. These were always the problems. It was never Baker Mayfield or Jalen Hurts in the offense. It was always whoever was controlling the defense, which usually ended up being Alex Grinch for the last couple of years. So um, this will be the this will be a good testament to see which defense steps up at at different times. Um, I don't think it'll be like whatever team gets the most stops will win. Um, I think there will be plenty of stops on one side of the ball. Uh, it just depends if USC can get more than like three stops a game. And uh, I, I'm not sure that they will. Yeah, that was what Ryan and Shotgun told me is that USC has to operate every game with like the thinnest of margin for error because their defense yeah. is so bad. Like they basically have to go into games knowing that they have to score 40 points to have just a chance at winning. Um, yeah. And that's what played out last week against Washington. That's probably what will play out this week against Oregon. Um, I mean, I I, th- I think the game will be decided for, by Oregon defensively of how few of guys can they send up front in the front seven or wherever the, you know, the defense comes from to generate enough pressure to impact Caleb Williams and to drop back as many guys as possible. Like, if, if Oregon can get a consistent and effective pass rush with four guys, like I'm not going to say we're going to see a Notre Dame performance where that's such an outlier of a game for them offensively. Agreed. Um, like some of that was because they had five turnovers. Caleb didn't play very good. He made some really stupid throws, but like just from a yards and yard per play average and all of that, like it's so low compared to everything else. Like, I don't think we're going to see that, but um, we could see Oregon, you know, somewhat keep things in check. Like to Jared's point, like we might see Oregon get four or five stops defensively. And that puts a huge pressure on a really, really bad defense to match that against an equally as good offense. Um, this game's going to be won by Oregon in my eyes of what the front four does defensively. I think that's a good place to start. I, I'm in, I'm in agreement there. Um, because I do think undoubtedly the USC receivers and tight ends and all those guys are going to put pressure on the back end. I, I, we'll, we'll see how Oregon holds up just playing man, if that's how they want to play. Like, but to your point, if, if they can get after Caleb Williams and now we have to also acknowledge he's really, really tough yes. to get down once you get to him. Like this is Cam Ward. Like this is, um, I it's guess better than Cam Ward. I think. definitely better than Cam. I'm just trying to think of quarterbacks Oregon's played this year who are, who are tough to bring down once you even get there. Like, I don't know if there's anybody else off the top of my head that really reminds this year, no. me. This year, no. Um, but like Cam Rising. Tough yeah, to get down. Tough to get down, yeah. But not this year. Not this year, yeah. But Ward is – like, just think about that game and, like, how Oregon's defense, I actually thought, going back and you watched that, like, played pretty dang well. But there were just a couple plays where Ward 
does Cam Ward stuff and escapes and, and makes a throw. And I think you even – you see that all the time with Caleb Williams. There's a clear instance to me, and there's a ton this season, but against Washington last year, last week where it was fourth and one and internal pressure finds him, he rolls and then fires just a BB to the end zone for like a 35-yard touchdown. Like that is a type of play that he can make where you might actually defend him pretty well and yet he's still able to score points. Like that That's my point with USC offensively is like you could actually play like a really good defensive game or have a couple really good defensive sequences and it not necessarily end in positive results for the defense just because of how good he is. And then also like I was trying to get to earlier of just the, the caliber of receivers here. Like this isn't Washington. Like, Washington has better top end talent than USC's guys. USC probably has more total guys, especially because McMillan didn't play in that game really against Oregon. But like, this is undoubtedly the the next best receiving core Oregon's face. Like Taj Washington is a blur. He's extremely explosive. He averages like almost 20 yards per catch. Um, And then you just keep going through it and it's guy after guy. Like I remember earlier in the year, it was Mm -hmm. like Dorian Singer is going to be the guy. He's like their three or four receiver. I know you're big on that guy. He's he's really hard to watch, but like that speaks to the depth of like that guy on a lot of teams in this conference would be, a number one or a number two. I mean, he, that's what he was at Arizona last year. And he goes to, he goes to USC and, and he's like, they're, they're four basically right now. And they have Zachariah mm-hmm. branch who they're not even utilizing you know, quite as much, even though he's like probably the most explosive guy on that roster. So it, th- there are undoubtedly skill talent guys here that can give Oregon difficulty in the secondary. So um, we'll see how they hold up. I'm, I'm a lot more confident in this Oregon secondary this week than I was going into the Washington game and just in terms of what I had expectations for, because I think they've played really, really well this year. Um, you can be critical at times when they do give up big plays, but I also think a lot of times you watch these big plays and it's like really good ball, really nice catch, Oregon guy ride around them. And I expect right. that to be the case this weekend. It's just how many of the big plays, I guess, does USC make um, in those instances where Oregon is just right there in coverage. Yeah. There's very rarely guys running, to use Jeff Boss's term, butt naked, or butt free down the sideline. Um, they have coverage. These are just really good throws by really good quarterbacks. And uh, unfortunately for Oregon, they've played a lot of them this year. And they're going to get another one in Caleb Williams. But uh, I'm, I'm with Matt. The internal pressure from Oregon's defensive front and um, you know anybody who's blitzing, whether it be a linebacker or, or Tysheem Johnson or Evan Williams from the secondary, um, it, it's, it's going to be the total game changer. This is a Brandon Dorless special written all over it. Um, he's going to be, he's obviously Oregon's best interior defensive lineman, but um, he's going to have every opportunity this game. I think Oregon should play him a lot of snaps to wreak havoc, to cause Caleb Williams to make mistakes. And that's exactly what Notre Dame did. Um, Notre Dame's defensive line broke through um, USC's offensive line all the time. And whether that be for a passing down or a rushing down, you know, they they held USC to under three yards of carry. You know, they forced Caleb Williams into tough decisions because he was getting pressured. Um, and that's why all those turnovers happened. There was one where it was just like uh, not, not Caleb's fault. But there were two of the three interceptions where pressure forced Caleb Williams into making a very, very, very quick decision. It was the wrong one. And Oregon, if you're going to try to slow down this offense of USC, you're going to need to – create some turnovers and that comes with directly applying pressure and uh, this is the year where Oregon has the guys to do it um, I think Oregon's secondary has been so good this year because of their pass rush it's a yin and a yang situation if you give the quarterback six seconds to throw every down it's going to be really hard to do something as a secondary member this year Oregon isn't really doing that they're bringing blitzes they have all the simulated <clears throat> excuse me they have all the simulated pressures in the world at, at their disposal now because of their linebacking core and their safeties and the cornerbacks who can all rush the passer. I think it's an opportunity for Oregon's defense to really make Caleb Williams uncomfortable. Um, Utah did that a good bit too. I know that they barely won, but you know, Oregon's offense is not Utah's offense. They exactly. are not Bryson Barnes. Bo Nix is not Bryson Barnes. Uh, Jaquindon Jackson is not Bucky Irving, and Oregon's offensive line is is just better. Now, will it happen? This is why we play the games. But um, I I have said this in, in podcasts past, maybe on Monday, that I think the linebacker core of Jeffrey Bossa, Jamal Hill, and Justin Jacobs, Bryce Betcher, and maybe Devin Jackson, if he plays, is going to be uh, heat-seeking missiles a lot of the time on Saturday. And that's what Cal did really well, and they're almost upset win against USC. 
Um, they blitzed a lot of linebackers, and I think Oregon's linebackers are more athletic. And they got to the pocket time and time and time again with Cal against USC. So um, I hope that Dan and Tosh were looking at that because I think Bassa, who's been – like one of Oregon's best pass rushers this season. If you go check the stats, he's been great. A lot of quarterback hits, not a lot of sacks, but that's what you need. You need pressure on Caleb Williams to go and make uh, potential mistakes or at least give your secondary then enough time to cover in man-to-man because that's what Oregon largely plays this season. So um, I think simulated pressures are going to be huge, and I think Brandon Dorless should have a good day at the office. Do we think, like, do we do we see Oregon send Bossa on blitzes or who spies for Caleb Williams? Because his creativity, his escapability, his playmaking ability is no one tops it in the country. And that's almost half their offense, it feels like, is Caleb, hold the ball as long as you can until you know you need to, to throw it because no no DB, no defense is good enough to hold a, a, a team in coverage for seven seconds. Can you hold the ball for six and then make a play? Like Sometimes that kind of feels like what their offense is. And um, I agree Jared's point of simulated pressures and, and bringing them from all over is critical. But at what point is it is it going to be a necessity or can you, you know, not necessarily a necessity, but how risky do we get? Do, do we see Oregon get? Um, do they bring the house? Do they – only bring one guy and then it's four, four guys, but you know, that fourth guy's coming from all over the place or I don't know that that's, I'm curious to see how often and where Oregon blitzes. We see Kyrie Jackson blitz, blitz off the corner spot. I don't know. Like it's going to be interesting to see the, the game plan. I think that's a fair point, Matt. I think you're going to be, I think Oregon's going to be really aggressive though. Um, and if, and if it gets to a spot where those aren't productive plays and Caleb makes a bunch of against, I'll bring up Cam Ward's name because he's the only quarterback sure. that's done that kind of thing regularly where he gets out of it and is able to make things happen after, then maybe you you switch things up. But I, I think you come up being really aggressive. And to Jared's point, like just go watch the Cal game. And like that was – what they chose to do is a bit of a roadmap for Oregon. And I think Oregon has clearly better personnel there, um, at least from an explosiveness at linebacker. Like, and that's what Oregon went – That's that was the whole point of this offseason was trying to get faster and more explosive there. So I anticipate they're going to come out hair on fire trying to get him into a spot where he's uncomfortable but if they show they can pick it up and and that that, that's not an area where Oregon has any success yeah I think maybe you see a bit of an adjustment there where you do say okay we're not able to get home there let's just keep somebody kind of hanging back to make sure he can't scramble for 20 because he's I think it's almost a bit of an underrated part of his game is what he's able to do when he gets downfield like he's had I think he leads the Pac-12 in rushing touchdowns this year. Some of that's just stuff around the goal line, like both yeah, a, year, um, a year ago. But, but like he he is he's the whole package offensively. He can beat you in just about every way. And so, I agree that you want to be cognizant of that part and, and adjust. But if you can get him on his backside or force him yeah. into mistakes early, like that's where you can see this game open up in my mind. So I think you're going to see that we're going to be really aggressive early on in this game. And if that strategy doesn't pay off, maybe you see them drop back and play a little more conservative as it goes. Um, well, these are the these are the perks of simulated pressures where yeah. you bring four guys every single time, but yeah. the yeah. offensive yeah. line just doesn't know which four guys it is. So uh, in terms of who is going to be a spy, um, I don't know if they start out spying. Um, I think that they will probably implement that during the game if it, become, if it becomes a problem. Um, I think Oregon's defensive ends are athletic, but probably not. A, they're definitely not athletic enough to run down Caleb Williams. Maybe Jordan Birch is, but um, he's not going to be on the field at all times. He's going to be subbing out just like everybody is on the defensive line. Um, if they if there is a sub or excuse me, if there is a spy, wouldn't it surprise me to be Justin Jacobs, dude who's fast, athletic, yeah. big and strong. Um, that's a guy who's probably physically capable by himself to bring down Caleb Williams um, not that these are the games that you get Justin Jacobs because he's a dominant run stopper. You get him for games like against Utah or against Oregon State. Um, but this is a game where he could shine just because of his pure physical uh, dominance over other guys. I mean, he's the biggest linebacker in the room by two inches and 20 pounds. So um, that could be the spy. But I think it's really going to be a lot of simulated pressures where um, you know you line up seven guys at the line, only four go, and you just don't know where they're coming from. 
And that creates even more chaos because not only does, does the offensive line not know where they're coming from, but the quarterback doesn't know where they're coming from. And uh, like I said earlier, this is the year where Dan and Tosh have been able to unleash these simulated pressures because they finally have the personnel to do it. Last year it was you know, pretty choreographed. Just, hey, we're going to run up the middle or we're going to blitz up the middle. Maybe every once in a while do an off tackle, like corner or safety. But this year it can be genuinely confusing for an offense to know where it's coming from. You saw that a lot against Utah and it got home a lot. So I would expect to see a lot of those on Saturday as well. We feel like this is probably the best defense USC's ever faced this season, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, Utah being the yeah. other one, but no, I, Notre, Notre Dame. Notre Dame's pretty damn good, too. Notre Dame's yeah. pretty good. If you look at just the statistical profile. Statistically, Notre Dame's better than what Oregon is. Yes. Um. So... Okay, it's it's probably one A or one B. Like that that feels pretty safe to say. Um, I bring that up because almost like does Oregon? They know their defense is elite. Is is this a game where maybe even though your your defense is so good, your best defense is your offense putting together four minute, five minute drives and just grinding down your opponent? Or do we see Oregon be like, hey, I, screw it. We, we we fully believe our defense. Uh, we're not going to play like, air quote, keep away uh, and just shrink the game. They're going to take shots. Like, first play, go go deep. Go send Troy. Send Ted's across the middle. You know, do we – or do we see just Oregon go methodically like they did um, against BYU last season? Um, we've seen it a couple times in spurts this year where they just – run, 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 and sprinkle in a couple passes? I, I don't know that answer. I'm, I'm curious to see how they approach that. Like, Because this is by far the best offense outside of Washington that they've faced. And you can probably argue that, you know, like you could you could argue USC's offense is better and you might win that. You know, you would get a lot of pushback, I don't think, on that comment. Um, from an explosive standpoint, from a scoring standpoint, from a yard standpoint, um, they're, they're very similar. I, I don't know. I'm just curious of what Oregon's offensive game plan will be. Like, do you ride Bucky knowing Utah is so bad uh, defending the run? USC, yeah. Um, no, I think that's a fair question. I mean, the good thing with Oregon is you can do – like, you can be successful doing either and probably both, which is what my answer probably is, which is, like, I, you're going to see Oregon take shots. Like, I almost guarantee it. I, I – I don't think this is going to be just a full on ball control game where Oregon runs it 48 times or something like that. Like I just isn't the MO of Will Stein. That isn't also really what you want to do to your running backs at least late in the season in my mind, you know, just in terms of the depth with Oregon is kind of lacking. I mean, I know they have two really good running backs, but if one of those guys do, does go down, you're looking at true freshmen. So I don't know if you want to like pound it, pound it, pound it now. You might get to a part in this game in the second half where that is like if, if you build a lead, I think absolutely you'll see Oregon maybe head that route. Like if Oregon's up 17 points in the third quarter, you might see a couple of drives where they just try to grind out five, six minutes and finish with a knockout blow touchdown. But I think our offensively early, especially though, they'll, they'll 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 be diverse. They'll be aggressive trying to throw the ball down the field because if you don't do that. USC can load up the box, not that they've been an in, like a, even a remotely good um, run defense, but you also look at the, at least, well, even Barnes, I was going to say two of the last year, but all three of the teams that have run the ball really successfully the last three games, and if you look at the numbers, it's pretty glaring if you're USC, like three straight games allowing more than 235 yards on the ground to Utah, Cal, and Washington. Mm -hmm. But all three of those offenses also prove that they could throw the football a little bit which is why, like, I do expect Oregon to be – in part because Oregon's pass offense is really effing good too. Like, so, yeah, I think right. they're going to be quite balanced. And I think – but I do think, to Matt's point, like, if you do if you do build a lead, why not play keep away late and try to minimize possessions? Are you feeling, Jared, like this is an opportunity well, to just, like, flex? Is that what you're thinking? Well, I, I, I think it is an opportunity to flex. But what I was going to say was – have we seen Oregon do it this year where they're just like, hey, we're going to run an eight-minute really. drive? I don't think like, that's I, 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 Against that's Texas real. Tech, I think they had one big drive or one long drive against Texas Tech where they went there. But we always – we keep referencing, like, the BYU game from last year. Like, that was, like, a solid 13 months ago. Like, 
Kenny Dillingham isn't here. Like, I don't know if they're, I don't know if that's in their MO to go out there and run an eight minute drive. And I, I don't think it's going to be the case on, I think on situ- Saturday. I think situationally it might be, but just if they have a lead late, but I, I agree with it you. might be, but we didn't even see that against Washington where they had a lead late. Like they, they took some they took time, but it's still like, huh? Is it, they took a shot to try. They took a shot down the sideline on third and short. Like, I don't know if I'm just saying, like, I don't know if that's basic. Like, I'm sure they are capable of it. They have the personnel and the running backs and the offensive line to do so. But I think Will Stein's just out there having fun, man. He's letting Bo Nix go throw. And I think that's what's going to happen on Saturday. Like, like, yeah, like it would be a good idea to keep USC's offense off the field for as long as possible. The other, the flip side of it is like, is USC's defense going to stop Oregon from scoring really fast? Like, I, I'm sure if Oregon could try to run a, a good old eight or six to eight minute long drive, but, you know, Bucky Irving's pretty damn good. So is Jordan James. Like, they might just spring free for three 20 yard runs and all of a sudden they're like at the 20 yard line. So um, I think they could try it for sure. I just think that Oregon's offense is going to be too explosive. Like, for the same reasons that Eric just went through. Um, the last three games over or 235 more yards on the ground. Um, and, all three of the teams were able to throw like Cal, uh, you know, sorry for Fernando Mendoza, but not a great quarterback. Um, neither is Bryson Barnes and a pure quarterback conception, but all those guys had success. And, you know, Bryson Barnes had, you know, probably the most success in that fourth quarter drive where he ended up winning the game for Utah. Like Oregon's just going to be able to move the ball theoretically. Um, however, they so please. And so I, I, I think, Regardless of if they try to or not, I think that USC's offense is going to see the field because Oregon's just going to score and score and score. And we'll see. Like this goes back to my earlier point. Like we'll see if USC can get some stops here because it doesn't look great, at least on paper. All right, uh, let's take a quick break and we'll dive into uh, our game predictions and bold picks and update the standings. All right, welcome back to the Yachts and Audible's podcast. Um, game picks from last week. Uh, Eric had the high score. He went. Uh, he had two right, two, two wrong. Jared and I both went one and three last week. Uh, standings remain the same, but become ever so tight now. Uh, Jared has a one-score lead over me, and I have a one-score lead over Eric uh, in the standing. So another two and two run by Eric and he's right there in first place or one behind Um, game prediction leaderboard. Nothing changes. We all hit the spread and we also hit straight up. All right. Offensive uh, team prediction starting off with this one. Um, I'm going to go. I've said they're not good defensively, so I have to back that up. Um, USC gives up the most yards per play this season um, to date. Uh, last weekend at home against Washington, they gave up a season high 7.9 yards per play. Um, it's a lot. That's a uh, lot. <laughs> yes. Um, I think Oregon's going to do even better than that. Um, they've had four games this season when they've hit eight or more. Stanford, Hawaii, Washington State, and then the highest is Portland State at 10. So give me Oregon hitting eight yards per play or more against USC's defense. Bold one. I like it. Um, I referenced this stat a moment ago about opposing rush success against USC of late and three straight teams doing it. Oregon's going to become the fourth. I don't even know if that's bold, so I'll put a little bit on top of it. I'm not going to go matching Washington running for 316 because that seems like – I mean, it could certainly happen. I'm not discounting that possibility, but it also feels like that makes that's almost a little too bold. Um, so I'll, I'll say Oregon rushes for what I think is a um, a season high against FBS competition of 249 or more. So I'll just say 250 to make it to make it a nice, pretty number. So 250 or more on the ground for the uh, the Oregon run game. That's nice. Uh, team prediction. I just think uh, Oregon's gonna. I think they're going to flex a little. I got them going over 600 total yards, which would also be the most that, or, that USC's defense has allowed this year. 
Um, 572, let me double check. Yep, 572 is the current high as it was last week against Washington. Um, interesting stat from that Washington game, to go back to Matt's point of the 7.9 yards per play. Uh, USC averaged 8.2. So that was, uh, that, was, that was a tough game to lose. But I think Oregon's probably going to finish around that same number where it's over 7.9 and go with 600 or more yards uh, total uh, against USC's defense. And then we're going to run it back. Offensive player prediction. Uh, I talked about this a little bit in the last segment that we did. I think Oregon's going to throw the ball a lot. I know that USC's defense is incredibly susceptible to the run game. I think they're going to set it up with that. Take some deep, deep shots deep to Troy Franklin. I got him over six catches, over 115 yards, and over one and a half touchdowns. So I expect a big Ooh. day from Troy Franklin. Um, I think he's... Probably pound for pound the best wide receiver in this game by far. I don't think I that anybody on USC's, at least at the top end talent, maybe in two years, Zachariah Branch would would rival that because of his pure talent. But right now, Troy Franklin's the dude. So um, I expect him to have a dude-esque performance. Zachariah Branch, just briefly, he is so – He's so cool. I'm so electric. Oh my gosh, dude. Oh. Yeah. Oregon was in that recruitment. Sorry, I just kind of gushed over a little man crush there. But just watching his plays, like so especially, fun. he's so good. Um, I agree, though, in terms of the Troy element that he will be the pound for pound the best receiver in this game. And like statistically, he's challenging Adunze, by the way, as like the top dog in the conference. Yeah, just you know, mm-hmm. like he's he is having the season we expected he could have. And if he puts up the numbers you're talking about, he inches very close. Like it's possible he breaks all these individual single season receiving records by the end of the regular season and goes into postseason play, just adding more separation on those. Yeah, um, King of the Hill. Yeah. This is the best receiving season we have ever seen um, from an Oregon receiver. Knock on wood, he's available the whole way. Okay. Um, sticking with the run game, I'm going to go Jordan James with a career rushing day of 104 yards or more. Um, I kind of already had my spiel there where if Oregon's going to run for 250, it's not going to only be Bucky Irving. I mean, who knows? Maybe Bucky Irving goes out there and breaks Kenyon Barner's single-game rush record, which is like 320 yards, which incidentally happened against USC. Gosh, Matt, what was that? Decade or so? 2012. Yeah, about a decade, a little more than a decade ago. I don't expect that's the result because that game – I just remember watching that game being like, they really just don't know how to stop him. They just have no answer for him. And then Oregon, Chip Kelly just kept drumming it up. All right, just keep giving it to him. Run it back. Um, so I don't expect Bucky to quite have a game like that, but I do think Jordan's going to be effective. And I think both running backs will. It wouldn't stun me at all if this is a, a, a two guys run for a hundred yard game, which I know was, I think Jared's pick last week against Cal. Is that right? That you, that was your prediction. Yeah. Yeah. I think I had him running for both 135. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll take Jordan for, for his new career high of over 104. Uh, that post game USC, 2012 show was epic. Uh, I remember listening to that from the press box. Um, I have a similar rushing one. Um, Bucky Irving, though, um, his career high is 149. He did it twice last season versus Washington, North Carolina. That number might kind of surprise you considering just how good he is. Um, It's a little low. Uh, his season high this season is 129, which came against Washington State a few weeks ago. Uh, I, too, believe we're going to see both Jordan and Bucky have big days. So I'm not going to go career high, but um, it's in play. I'm going to say season high, 130 or more rushing yards for, for Bucky Irving in this game. I just think I, – I think they're going to take shots. I think I – think, Bo's going to get his normal amount. I just think uh, this is a game in which they're going to see if, you know, very similar to what happened against Cal. Like they're going to throw him the ball early and then, oh, yeah, we probably should run the ball here and wear this team down and then get a little bit of separation and then get them on. Um, um, Matt, really, one, one, just one quick aside. It, it Because of how poor USC's defense has played, it wouldn't be surprising to me if multiple of ours – just collectively hit. Like if Troy Franklin has a massive game, Bucky Irving sets a single high, and they also run for the most yards. You know what I mean? Like that, it, a lot of these hit just because of what we've seen from USC's defense so far. I think there's a high probability that Dan's not going to run the score up, but 
they're they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna put points up on the board, and it I, it is technically putting you know running the score up, but I, I think I don't think there's like a malicious intent towards it. It's just more so of hey, we're playing a big name, we're playing on on Fox, and we've hmm. we've got a Heisman candidate, we've got a national championship caliber team. Let's make a statement. I think we could see like to your point, Eric. I think we could see a lot of big days individually, and co- which would collectively mean a really big day offensively. Um, all right, defensive team prediction. Uh, it feels weird saying an Oregon defense holds shows up and holds uh, USC under 500 yards of offense. Like that feels like a strange accomplishment because it's like 500 yards isn't a good thing. That's like you but against that USC. Guy. Yes, you should, but against USC, that is a good thing. Uh, USC has had 500 yards of offense uh, six out of ten times this season. Uh, two of the four times they didn't hit 500, they lost. Um, and the the other loss came last week against Washington when um, they had over 500 yards, but so did Washington, or closer to 600 yards of offense. Um I just think Oregon's defense is going to be able to generate some pressures, generate uh, some sacks. I think they're going to get a couple sacks. I'm not going to say that they're, you know, just be all over Caleb Williams, but the, his ability to extend plays opens the door for sacks. If Oregon can get to him. Um, I just think it's going to be a day where they tackle in space. There's going to be a couple explosion plays, but you know, Oregon's going to show up and they're going to, be the fifth team this season to hold USC under 500 yards of total offense, which doesn't seem like a hard task when you just look at that number. But when you look at the opponent and the guy that's at quarterback, that's a pretty hard ship to get. You might not say they're going to get a lot of sacks, but I'm going to predict it. Um, right. I mean, I, USC to start the year was actually did a little bit better job than you would think of protecting him, but it's really been a, a struggle. Five straight games with three or more sacks allowed. That includes a season high six against Notre Dame. And having watched that game, it probably could have been and should have been a little bit more even. Um, Oregon's pass rush has been pretty consistently impactful, like for the whole season. I remember that was kind of a thing we were talking about early on when they started to get home a little bit. I'm like, is this going to carry over? And it and it has. Like, this is one of the better pass rushes in the country. Um, this could be an interesting game in terms of we kind of talked about it. Like, how aggressive does Oregon choose to be? I think they're going to come out very aggressive and just try to put Caleb Williams on his butt. And if Caleb can make a play and throw it 60 yard down, turns down field, which he's certainly capable of for a touchdown, you just kind of live with it. Um, but I think Oregon will get home a fair amount in this game. So I'm actually, this is quite bold, I think, but I'm going, they're going to match Notre Dame's six sacks from several weeks ago. Um, USC right now is eighth in the Pac-12 in sacks allowed. Oregon right at the top of the conference leaderboard, four sacks forced. So um, I think it's going to be a big day for, for those guys up front. And I think this isn't a part of my prediction, but I do think we're going to see several of those be just from not that they only bring four, but from traditional down linemen getting home. I, I do think this could be a big door this day, a, good, a big birch day. Maybe Casey Rogers. Casey Rogers, by the way, had an awesome game last week rushing the pass. Yeah. You can see that continuing. Um, but the internal stuff, especially just because of USC's weaknesses. Um, again, they've got tackles that are, are pretty capable, but inside, a guy like Doralis could could kind of feast, I think. Yeah, I'm with you there. Um, team prediction. I've got Oregon's defense holding USC to under five yards of play. We're doing another yards per play stat here, but uh, under five, that would just be for the second time this season. They've hit 5.1 before, but the only team to hold them to under five yards per play was Notre Dame in that 48 to 20 loss. Uh, They held them to 4.2. You know, I I made this prediction based off of everything I said um, about the Oregon's defense and the internal pressure and the simulated pressures and getting home to Caleb Williams, making his life a bit annoying back there um, with all these pressures and hopefully, you know, making, making him, you know, make poor decisions and pressure will help that. Um, I just think that Oregon's defensive line will be able to get home. uh, And I think if they can't, I don't think Dan and Tosh are going to be afraid to dial up some pressures and some blitzes off the corners, off the edge, whatever the case may be. Um, And I think Oregon's secondary, we're going to see a lot of subbing. 
because it's going to be a lot of seconds out there in coverage. And unlike Cal, where Kyrie Jackson, Jaleel Florence basically played the entire game until the very end of the fourth quarter, you know, Oregon has that depth at cornerback where you at least feel pretty comfortable with Nico Reed and Dante Manning and Triquiz Bridges. Um, I know they're not Kyrie Jackson, Jewel Florence, but to bring those guys off the bench is still pretty darn good because those were impact players this year. They're impact players last year. Um, so I think we'll see a lot of that just to keep guys fresh and try to keep those, um, uh, like those multiple long coverages low and try to keep, keep guys coming in and out. Uh, so point. under five point five yards per, per per play sorry uh no you're good no worries defensive player prediction uh, i alluded to it earlier uh, i've got jeff bassa over four and a half tackles over half a sack and over one and a half tackles for loss uh i did the tackles kind of low because i don't i think this is going to be a safety tackle game i think this is going to be an evan williams or Tysheem johnson special maybe even a steve stevens in there um i think that there's going to be opportunities for, for jeffrey to make a tackle or two um, but he's not going to be around the ball as often as uh, Evan Williams might be. So, but uh, like I said in the simulated pressures, uh, I think Boss is one of the best pass rushers Oregon has on this defense. Um, you saw it against Cal; he timed up a good amount of snaps, uh, got to Mendoza, made him throw the ball away early. I think he gets home at least once on Caleb Williams and brings him down, uh, either himself or with another player. Um, and I think he gets in the backfield a couple times and maybe there's a screen pass that he jumps and that he gets a tackle for a loss. So uh, I think he's going to be the guy on Saturday. Just a moment on Abbas. I just I want to offer a little bit of appreciation considering we were, I know I was in particular pretty hard on him this offseason in terms of how he played a year ago. He's added a lot of weight. He's maintained the athleticism that was always there. And I think he's just held up a lot better in the run and has always yeah. been a good coverage linebacker. But He's playing at an all-conference caliber level. I don't know if he'll be recognized that way. Uh, I'd have to look to the conference a little more closely to see kind of who else is in that conversation. But he's he's playing very, very good football, definitely the best of his career. Um, and I'd say especially over probably the last four or five games, he's really taken it up a notch. So I like that pick, Jared. Um, I'm going to go with Dorless having his first multiple sack game of the season. Um, oh, hasn't okay. had one since last year against Stanford when he had three. Um, I brought it up earlier. I was kind of worried Jared might take it because Jared also brought brought Mr. Dorless up a moment ago in terms of uh, his potential to have an impact here. But I, I think Brandon is probably their best overall defensive player, one of the best players on this team. And this is a game where I think they're going to need him to step up and make some plays. I think he's going to do it. And I think Again, because of the matchups that like we've talked about, and I won't even go over it too many times, but I just think the interior guys are going to have success. So give me Dorless for the, with at least one and a half, I guess, sacks for multiple. All right. Uh, I'm going a tackle number. Um, I think this is going to be a good game for a guy like Jamal Hill. Um, his athletic ability, his coverage ability, uh, his speed at the linebacker position, um, his season high in tackles right now is five. His career high is 11, which came week one last year against Georgia. He's not going to get 11. Um, five feels like a solid number to start with, um, but I'll bump it up by one since he's already done it this season um, and say he hits a new season high in tackles with six uh, against USC. I, I just think that, there's going to be a lot of opportunities right near the line of scrimmage or shortly after it with what USC does from a play calling perspective, from a player personnel perspective. Uh, and he's going to be on the field quite a bit because of who they play. I don't think, I don't think USC and Cal's offenses are like just straight mirrors of each other, but they're closer to what Utah is or what, um, you know, not Colorado, but Texas tech is, and Jamal played a lot and was very productive against Cal on that, that offense. So, all right, score prediction. Um, I think this is going to be a, a game in which people are going to look at it and say it's probably going to be a shootout or it potentially could be a shootout. Um, I, I do think because there's going to be so much scoring uh, by both teams that the scoring actually goes down a little bit. Like, I don't think Oregon's going to hit 50 um, just because 
USC is going to have some some plays and they're going to have some drives that chew up clock. Oregon's going to have some some plays and some drives that chew up clock, and it's just going to be one with who's the more efficient team. I think Oregon's going to be the more efficient team. We got more confidence in Oregon getting stops uh, in this game. The spread last I looked last night, 14 and a half. Um, I think Oregon covers that. And I'm going to go 43-24. I get to 43 because I think we're going to see a two-point conversion by Oregon in this game. Um, 43-24 Oregon covering the spread by 19. I like the thought of Oregon going for two early just because we've seen Dan, and especially in the bigger games this year, kind of do that to make opponents, excuse me, play kind of catch up and have to find, you know, find ways to, to match that. So I like getting a weird score. Um, I've had the same margin I'll show, but I've tweaked the, like the exact score, like at least half a dozen times as we talk times I've gone like, Oh yeah, USC is going to, they're going to score more. So I've added a couple here and added some to Oregon and it kind of going, well, maybe they won't take in some way where I'm going to land is Oregon 45 USC 31. So just narrowly not a cover for Oregon. Um, Obviously, wouldn't be surprised at all if Oregon does cover. And, and frankly, like I wouldn't be surprised entirely if Oregon has another statement game and wins fifty-two to twenty-one or something like that, and we come out going like, "Oh man, they did it!" This yeah, is, I agree with that. This is the knockout game. And if anybody in the country has doubts about Oregon, like go look at this game tape. Go watch what they just did to a USC team that we know is, has a lot of faults, but has has handled, you know, at least been com- really competitive with the good teams aside from Notre Dame this year. Um, but I think I think this one is going to be shootout esque early. I think there's going to be a lot of points. Mm-hmm. Oregon's defense will settle in in the second half. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Oregon's up one score. Or it's even a tie game at half, and it's like 24-21 or something like that. 28, 20, 27, something in that range. And then the second half, Oregon's defense settles in, finds some answers, and and Oregon's offense finds enough to to separate. So I think Oregon wins 45, 31. I don't think this is a game in like late in the fourth quarter, you're sweating as much as this is a game where Oregon never fully separates and just blows the doors open, but is always in control in the second half and, and wins 45, 31 to, to basically to get pretty close to clinching a spot in the Pac-12 championship game, depending upon what happens around them this week, Oregon state obviously plays a, a big, a big game. Um, and so we'll see what happens, or should I say that's the next week, I guess, against Washington. So, but we'll yeah. see what happens in terms of, of everything around him. I think Oregon inches closer to, to to setting up that rematch with Washington on Saturday. Would you like to hear a very good second stat or second half stat for your argument, Eric? Let me have it. It comes from our dear friend Jeff Schwartz. Oregon has allowed five total touchdowns in conference play in the second half. Two to Washington, one to Colorado, one to Washington State, and one to Tikal. So second half adjustments have certainly been quite good this year. Um, all right. Now's my prediction. I got Oregon 56, 34. Uh, I think USC will score the ball, but let me get into it. I think if given the opportunity, Dan Lanning will run the score up to 70 plus. That's just what I'm going to say. Um, I think this is a opportunity to showcase Oregon's talents. I know that it's going to be on the uh, you know, late kick. It's going to be the Pac-12 after dark. 7.30 p.m. Pacific, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, but this is going to be a game with a large visitor list um, for Oregon and recruits, a lot of kids from Southern California. Um, or I feel like this is kind of like a blood-in-the-water type scenario for Dan. This is We've talked about USC struggles. They talked about their disappointing season, already having three losses, three in the last four games nonetheless. There's some blood in the water. Um, maybe not everybody on USC is up for this game. Uh, well, maybe they are. We'll, we'll find out on Saturday. But I think that Oregon will score ad nauseum. I think they'll have opportunities to score whenever they want. I think their offense will come out firing. I think that the defensive coordinator change for USC may impact something in the first quarter. Um, but I think that's about where it will land. It's after the first quarter or after the first couple drives, I think Will Stein and their offensive staff are smart enough to understand the adjustments that are being made and then go on to – running the ball down the field. Um, I have 56. I thought about going into the 60s range, but I think 56 is pretty nice. Um, I think USC does get on the board. I think Caleb Williams is inevitable. I think it's really hard to stop. And I think their wide receiver group is the deepest they'll play. Oregon will play this year. 
Yeah. Won't have the top end talent, but it'll certainly be the deepest and just the overall talent of the group. Um, that's just, I think Dan ran it up against Cal on purpose. And I think he'll do it again this week against USC. It's going to do it for us here on the Austin Audible's podcast. Thank you for listening to the show. Next time you hear from us will be sometime on Sunday. I don't even know when. Uh, it, it'll be late. It'll be late early, pod. however you want to discuss it. Um, hopefully it's one in which we can get through this stuff real quick because that's not one where I hope it's a back-and-forth game and there's a lot of reactions that we have to give because – it's going to be a late one, 7.30 kickoff uh, at Austin Stadium. Enjoy the game. Look forward to, to talking to you guys here on the podcast here in a couple of days. But until then, you've been listening to the Yachts and Autos podcast. No rebuttals from us on Matt's predictions. I just wanted to say that last. But talk to you later, folks. I think a big man is going to catch an interception. Peace. <laughs>